Thank you. That's a very touching for me. And um, I'm going to put it right here. And she asked me to introduce myself. And do not worry. It's always a terrifying moment for people who English is the first language to say my name, which is, has a lot of R's and Rosalia and, and Fajardo. Rosalia Fajardo. And a lawyer from Colombia. Not Colombia. <laughs> I know we always said because we feel very proud of our, our name, Colombia, not Colombia, which is not offense to the DC area. And I uh, have been living in here for almost 30 years in the United States. And uh, I have a daughter whose name is Margarita, oh, Margarita Maria, who. <laughs> was born with intellectual disabilities and is a young adult woman uh, striving life and living independently a game as witches as a Latina mother. <laughs> we are a family of three and husband, Margarita and myself, but here in the United States. Back in Colombia, we are coming from a very huge extended family. I have six brothers, and nephews, cousins, and you name it. But I adopted my family, my community. They are part of my myself because I have been living with them for for more than more than almost thirty years, and uh, they are part of my family now. And, and that means that I have family from all around the world, and especially all around. South America and Central America and Mexico, and of course, my land, my home, which is USA. This is home for me. Came about 30 years as a refugee, uh, not knowing any word in English, and I am still feeling that terrifying moment to speak on public and I was remember the first time that I did it was exactly here in Richmond. I think it was 18 years ago, 70 years ago when my uh, supervisor that is still be my supervisor and as part of the board of ARC, Sherry Takemori, Takemoto said, you are going to, you are invited to speak with me. And I said, she was joking and I said, oh, I'll come. to speak, <laughs> I, I almost fainted, but I said, okay, I have to do it. Anyway, I have to do it. I don't know if people understood. Oh, I was so, you know, uh, are you okay? Okay. 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 And, uh, and that was the way how to start to be a speaker in this adopted second language, third language for me, and um, but I still having butterflies and um, when I have to present and I do this so often, but as a, the famous singer from our culture, Celia Cruz said, the day that I don't have fears to sing, I'll be doing, I won't cut it. And that's the same what I have to happen to me at this, at this particular moment. Uh, I don't know if it's someone is going to hold me or I had to do it by myself, but let's see. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Okay. Okay. Someone was supposed to help me to pass the presentation. Uh, okay, demographics. And for that, I need to be here because if I don't have someone to help me, I need to be on the podium. As you can see uh, by the census 2020, the Hispanic population compromised 
10.6% of the Virginia population in the Commonwealth, according to the Census Bureau. 56.5 Latino Virginians are US born, including Puerto Rico. That means that we have a real new generation of Latinos born in, in the state of Virginia. Uh, foreign born Latinos are primarily from El Salvador, Mexico, with growing numbers of Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. And I need to say that the census did not, didn't include my husband country, which is Bolivia. And we have a huge, a huge Bolivian community living in Northern Virginia who provides us that cultural sense of, of who we are through the dances and uh, participating in, in numbers who you cannot imagine showing up, show, showcasing this beautiful indigenous culture. And they are, have a heavily presence in Northern Virginia, the Bolivians. I, I can say after Salvadorians, they are the second biggest um, population resident in Northern Virginia. Virginia has 2,800 students of Latino heritage, 33%, and this is very important to see, 33% reporting having limited English proficiency. And with the arrival of so many new students, I don't know how accurate will, the number will be, but we know that almost every day we are increasing, having more students uh, who English as a second language is, is how they identify. Latinos live through the state of the, the state. 24 Virginia jurisdictions have more than 5,000 Latino residences. And it's, it's amazing. I have been working at the, at the field of the special education and disability rights for 20 years and 25 years. And I have been traveling all around the state of Virginia and see how much we have been growing in a very meaningful uh, ways. And it, it is because I'm volunteer and I always working with the Mexican consulate and the Salvadorian consulate, helping them uh, to reach out their nationals and to tell them about this. When I was very intimate, connected with the special education system, telling the families about, you know, what you have and what you can access when you have a child or children or youth with disabilities. And they are everywhere, <laughs> literally, they are everywhere in a very positive way. Uh, then an estimate of 600 migrant workers travel through Virginia each year, according to Legal Aid Justice Center. And they are located mainly in uh, Virginia Beach, where they are the, all the fish industry and through the 81 corridor where they have the pines and you know all the uh, strawberries picking all the uh, fruit that we eat every day in our tables. Normally there used to be a lot of migrant workers going back and forth but now they have more tendency to kind of come and stay because Virginia offers uh, so many advantage for especially the education when the uh, migrant workers want to educate their kids, a good education. And Virginia has offered a lot of good education for them. Okay. Um, diversity within Latino community. Uh, and I'm going to talk more calm. As for Latinos, our pride, our first pride is to say, where are we coming from? And uh, Colombia, Mexico is kind of, it's so important for us to be identify where they're coming from or where our parents are coming from. Like my daughter, she's a very proud Colombian American girl and she works the Colombian, she forcing me this that I have today, there's a, Mommy, you need to wear the Colombian flag. <laughs> I'm not very used to it, but I have my pre-Colombian, which is identify me as a Colombian. And I always wear in something like that, which is the, our indigenous history in gold. And uh, 
in this people we have Latinos here. Where are you from? Oh, Colombia. And we have we have this spirit so high because we won yesterday the World Cup game against Germany. And you know, kind of, oh my God, we won to, like we won the World Cup, but we won the game. And for the first time, the uh, soccer, the women's soccer team from Colombia. And how about others, Colombians, Mexicans? But you have something in, in here because you love the food. That means everybody here is from Mexico, Salvador, Colombia, empanadas, pupusas, tamales. Do we all speak the same language? In, in, in terms of literally and plain language, we do, but we don't. Spanish. I'm talking about Spanish. And it's a huge difference that I'm going to say more later about the languages. People assume that we all speak the same language. It's not. Uh, it's not. People from South America speak a totally different uh, language. People from Central America, we call the triangle, Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, even Costa Rica. Uh, they speak at Spanish, but in totally different ways, in totally different, but still, that's something, is the primary factor that identify us as a Latinos, la lengua, el español. Uh, different geographic, economic, and educational backgrounds. There is the difference, because it's not the same someone who, are, are coming from El Salvador, Honduras, or Guatemala, where the access to the education is very limited because the economic conditions, because the country has been not developed in the same way like South American countries, like Colombia, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, which they don't count itself as a, Latinos because they speak Portuguese, but they are from South America and they come here too. And uh, Ecuador, uh, we have a high level of the economic development in comparison of South America, uh, Central Americans. Even Mexico, we, you cannot assume that all the Mexicans are coming from rural areas. Mexico has huge, huge city, the EFE, as we call Mexico, the capital, Monterrey, Guadalajara, they are half of the major universities and major uh, manufacturer uh, industries. That means that they have a, a different system of education. But if you go to the deep mountains of Mexico, Oaxaca, Zacatecas, the, the population who come here are from the rural areas where they don't have that easy access to the education because they do not speak Spanish. Is almost Guatemala more like the area that Linda Bridge Baptist Church goes into? It, I, the church I, that the, I attend mm -hmm. and I'm a member of, we, we, we sponsor a, a village there in Guatemala. Guatemala. Is all of Guatemala more like that? Or is that I would say the Guatemala is 70% 70, 70 rural areas in the capital, what they call Ladinos, because they are the mix. You know, the whites, uh, immigrants from Spain, from European countries, Italy, and some from the Middle East, because they, Guatemala and El Salvador have a presence of uh, Middle Easterns who immigrate to the Americas, um, they are a little bit more wealthy, if I can say that. But uh, the majority of the mountains regions and the indigenous regions are under poverty. That's why we have this wave of immigrants from Guatemala who are totally diverse in between them because they speak different languages like Mexican, Mexican indigenous 
groups. And here, especially here in around Richmond metropolitan area in Northern Virginia, we have a huge Guatemalan presence who are totally different in terms of in between them. In between them about language that some groups speak man and some group speaks Kiche. You, you can see the difference in be, only in between them. Uh, do not speak Spanish at all. They immerse quickly because uh, they want to kind of be part of the mainstream community. And the first, the first step that they do is be able to express themselves in Espanol. And is it true that in those countries like Guatemala and areas like that, people with disabilities is put in one place separate? Yes, I'm going, I'm, my next couple of slides, and I'll be talking about that. Okay, uh, I just want to give a background on how, uh, how different and not different we are for those who are services providers or just members of the community, because we are as a Hispanic or Latino, or whatever you want to call us, we are part of the society and we are everywhere in many ways. All that. Uh, continue, development, education, history, religion, language, different language and dialects, importance of knowledge of the cultural respect and build the trust. I already talked about this and it's very important for those who serve communities who are teachers, administrators, therapists, and especially in this field of uh, re rehab and special education and transition to adult life. Uh, the, that services providers and paraprofessionals and professionals build the trust and how we build the trust, respecting the differences. And, and it's, the same, it's, it's the both ways. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the both ways when we, we, I mentioned the beaches. But when I said this, all this, we all have, that was the first thing they was going to do. Okay. Hold on. This is my daughter checking on me because I drove, I drove by myself and she was kind of, oh, mommy, she doesn't trust me. And don't forget to turn it back on afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> It's a cultural respect to build the trust. And how we build the trust, how all, you know, because when we said all is all, I, can, I cannot assume that being a, a white Colombian, half Colombian, because my other half is from, from Spain. My dad was an Spaniard who emigrated to Colombia and married my mother who was a Colombian woman of color, uh, that everybody will assume, uh, can I, I never assume nothing with my communities. I first, my first step. In, in a very respectful way. Where are you coming from? Where is the phone? Not in the way that sometimes <laughs> I found out, so I'm like, oh, Colombia, oh, mafia, <laughs> Netflix, is it? no, 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 <laughs> we are better than that, <laughs> that's true, or, you know, Mexicans, or Salvadorians, oh, no, we, we need to build the trust, because finally, at the end, we need to serve them in the appropriate way that is mandated by the law because we are equal under the, under the law, under the law of this great nation. And I have a very fresh 
mine or the law because my husband is going to be American citizen next Saturday and I have to review all the civic of this country. <laughs> and, I, and I was in love and said, yes, we have a law, we have a, <laughs> we have a lot of <laughs> law that protect us. Um, let's see. Okay, I, 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 I think that I did it the very wrong way. Ah, my ADHD in place. Okay. We, okay, we were, okay. Yeah, we were in the, tell me with that, tell me that. Okay. Uh -huh. Wait. Back, 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 back. Uh, we no more. No. Next. Next. There we go. Okay. Okay. Differences. Mainstream culture, Latino culture, and how we perceive. And I'll be answering your question about. If it's in Guatemala, it's true that they are secluded in places. And that's why when they are arriving here, they perceive disability or the end of the world. Even myself, when Margarita was born, and they said she's going to face a lot of challenge in terms of in, in intellectually. She was born in Colombia. And at the time I was in Colombia, I was a lawyer that was an engineer. I said, no, you cannot say that to me. I'm a lawyer. He's a civil engineer. She cannot have any disability. She has to be perfect like me. And I, then I had to leave the country in a very in rush, <laughs> little in rush. I said, you can imagine through the, uh, cartel drug and I was working as a, as a prosecutor and I had to come leave and come here in the middle of nowhere in Washington DC and leaving that daughter behind. She was two years old and thinking, no, she's, she's perfect. She's going to be perfect. And then I discovered that disability is not the end of the world, but I discovered it here where in, by, literally by accident, I ended up working with uh, uh, an school in a survival mode. I went to be assistant teacher at Santa Colette School in Virginia, which is a Catholic school who provides services for um, students, adults uh, with severe disabilities who cannot be placed in the public school. And uh, that principal said, you are a little bit of a liar. And I said, why? Because you said in your resume that the person who recommended you said that you are a secretary, administrative assistant, but I sent my resume because what listed that I'm, I was a lawyer and I said, because I feel so proud where I am. My family is from a humble beginnings. For me to be a lawyer, I was the first in my family to graduate at, at the university, the first of the girls, because my, my sisters are very old, older than me. And I was able to, the, to go to the big city at the time, but for me it was a big city, a 16, 17 years old to a low school. That means how, they can, how it can erase my history my own history. No, I have to say that I'm a lawyer. I said, come on here. Just, you may, the person who recommended you said that you are administrative assistant who wants to get, make some money. And I said, no, I'm not. Okay, I, I kind of was guessing. And uh, I think that you will be interested to know about the IDA. That was the first time that I heard, and said, what is that? And she handed out, I vividly remember the, you know, the provisions of IDA, and I just had to read, and then I didn't last it 
that much at the Santa Colette School because someone who is part of this board or the art board, Sherita Kemoro was in looking for someone who was a Spanish speaker, bilingual. I, at the time, I can say that I wasn't bilingual. I was still monolingual, but anyway, <laughs> I went, I did an interview, and Sherry Takemoto had the courage to offer, present the offer to me. And I presented in Northern Virginia, my first workshop in Espanol <laughs> about <laughs> IDA. Educación especial, and families were open their eyes like this. And I said, it's not the end of the world. I always say that. Mm. Because, of course, we are coming from a country that the disability is garbage. Especially now, those days, in the Central American Triangle. South America has been gaining some development and pieces of legislation. And of course, for example, Colombia, we have we have a civil war who left so many young people disabled for both ways, civilians and militaries. And they are working, they have been working to kind of create ways to work after the disability. But for the Central Americas it's still the religion, oh, punishment from God, you know, I, we need to hide this from our, our uh, families, our social groups, and see the difference. It's totally unfamiliar, a word, the unfamiliar. And you can say that I'm an exaggerated. I'm still taking calls from families in Espanol even though I'm the director of the Multicultural Families and Independence Center of Northern Virginia. But I always take the call. I always. I have a five calls that I need to make when I come back tomorrow. And I, and I always ask the question, say, Senora Fajardo, I have a, a son who is autistic, a son who is the Down syndrome. And I say, what are you doing in regards of living independently? Oh, no. No, 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 no. He cannot be outside by himself or by herself. I say, why not? And how about when you pass? What's going to happen? You have to make that question to yourself. And I did a question very late in my life regarding Margarita, because I, I was disabled myself a year and a half ago. I have a tumor in my back. And I went through this horrendous surgery process, now walking. And I said, oh gosh, I can die. What is going to happen with Margarita? And at the moment, she wasn't driving. And she said, if you are still alive after the surgery, I'm going to move out. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> See, mommy. <laughs> See, mom, and she did it. January of the 2023, she said, Ciao, mommy. And I go, La Sale, what are you going to live by myself? And two months later, she was driving. And three months later, she has a driver license. And now she does DoorDash. <laughs> and she works with us. She lived with a Colombian family in a basement, independently. It wasn't easy. She left and she left everything behind. I was, what did she want? <laughs> it was the way, it was the only way. I never was going to let her to live independently. She was, she's 33. Yeah. Yeah, a beautiful, a beautiful young lady, very, very smart. <laughs> She, she was educated here. She graduated from high school here. I was able to reunify with her nine years after. She was a strong will. She was a strong said, I'm going to live by myself. If you are alive after all this process, I'm moving out. <laughs> no. Yes. 
She moved, of course. <laughs> Without any hesitation, she went out, she moved out. And three months later, she said, do you want me to see driving? I said, no, I cannot do see that. Oh, no, Margarita. So, well, at least buy the car for me. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. <laughs> and she's working at DoorDash, but she's also working, helping students at the independent center to, to, to gain that independence that she really has. Yeah. And she adores the students, and but she's doing DoorDash. And I said, uh, hola, Margarita, why are you doing? Working, mommy, I'm working. I cannot talk to you at this moment. It's raining. And <laughs> don't your stop on Friday, Margarita. Yeah, yes, mommy, I packed it. I put it there. The blinky blinky, don't worry, don't worry, mommy. <laughs> Let me work. I need to make money. <laughs> It's that's the totally the perception about disability that we have. Then from you know the, the autistic we have in here, and that's exactly the same to every Hispanic family and the Asians and the Hindu community because I've been navigating with all, you know, <laughs> and. It's, I have a family that will be later on. And can you pass, please? Uh, uh, I'll be talking about that, that case because I, I put it, I must remember that family. And we talk about breaches, remember? Build a connection and choose in different ways. Try to have someone who speaks Spanish. They don't feel like they are getting the full measures that we interpreted. I, Respect interpreters. But sometimes our families are totally lost with interpretation, especially in the special educational field and the disability rights and the access, ADA, all to this world of different language. And I want to say thank you to ARC because you did a beautiful job. I have this in here and doing this. I command ARC for doing a glossary of terms in disability community in Espanol and English. Thank you for doing this because that way families can get familiar and the, the interpreters will be able to do a better job, but sometimes that's the key of my success. Not that I, that I know much, because I don't know much at all, but I hablo español and I present in Spanish, you know, and I said, it's, it's not the end of the world. And Dios da, Hijos excepcionales para padres excepcionales. God gave kids, exceptional kids to exceptional fathers and mothers. Yes. And, and in Spanish. And they, they got it. It's not on the word. And I remember vividly every day, Judy Human, who was the mother of the ADA and IDA, that I met one day in my life presenting in this monolingual accent mm -hmm. English. And I, I don't know what I said to her in that presentation at your major university, but I just said, I want her to work with me in that voice. I said, no, no, no I cannot work with, with you. Why not? Because I'm not American citizen yet. You will be. And I did up. You have the magic to feel the to make the feel the parents that is not there or the world, and start to accept the disability, and for the services providers, and ended up to be one of the mentees of Judy Human. Who yes, I'm very proud of that. Was my friend until she passed about four months ago, and the promise that we did each other, we couldn't see each other anymore because the pandemia and I said hello how are you doing and she said good I said 
Margarita has plans to move out. I said, good for her. <laughs> I said, I almost died. I said, Doris. She says about war to me. And, uh, and we promised each other that we are going to see after our, my trip to Europe, because I went to Europe uh, to, to España, because I, every year I go to España to see my family. And Margarita didn't want to come with me, and she was preparing to move out. And, I did a promise to Judy that we were going to see each other, but we never did it. But she's looking up to me and I'm cumpliendo la promesa. Teach everybody, parents and administrators about the disability in our world. When I said in our world, in the Latino world, in the Asian world, in the Hindu world. Um, for those who are services providers and for those who are not, anyway applies, do your homework knowing about the specific communities. Don't, don't get confused. Mexican Conservadorians and in a very respectful way, well, you cannot mix communities. You cannot mix communities. You cannot talk about disability in the same way that you talk with a Guatemalan indigenous mother versus a Colombian or Argentina mother. Totally different, totally different words. Yes, ma'am. How do you go about that? Like you say, you just accept it. Where are you from? I'm always nervous because you guys just have, I feel like it assumes that they were born in America. Oh, you're Hispanic. Really, you're not from here. Can you speak that? No. No, it is, it is different because you will guess when somebody is born in here. It's born in here because it speaks English. But yeah, if it physically, you cannot assume that I'm Latina. Physically. But, <laughs> and I used to tease, I said, if I'm in silent, everybody will think in a gringa. If I'm not. But once I open my mouth, everybody will know that I have accent. And, and, and the English is my second language, but it is very proud. And now I can communicate at least with accent, but I can do it. But that question is, if it's not irrespectful, you say, where are you from? In a very respectful, where are you from? Well, I was for people who is born in here, but are from parents from, uh, 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 my parents are originally from Guatemala, but I, I'm, I'm born in here. At the moment, yeah. At the moment that you listen, how well or how bad, like me, speak English, you will say, oh, it's a Navy English speaker looking as a Latino or someone who is immigrant of first generation like me. My daughter speaks the most beautiful English. And not, not only that, she writes the most beautiful way in English, something that I cannot do. Never, I couldn't achieve to, you know, classes and classes and said, at the end I have Margarita, Ben, I'm writing this, <laughs> I'm mommy. <laughs> no, 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 you know, and, and she speaks both perfectly. As a little as accent in Spanish, of course, because she went to high middle school, elementary last year, and middle and, and, and then college, and all the friends who are Latinos, they in between them, they speak uh, English. Uh, bring information about what you have to offer and how it will make a difference in a very um, in disability. We have, our community have the tendency to be sad and the healing and everybody. It's, it's not being the, the information in the ways they said, I have a resource for you. They certainly will help your son or your daughter to achieve more goals in their life, more opportunities. If they are adults, they will say, they will have the opportunity to work. Something that in our minds, because how we perceive disability back in South America and in, in Central America, work? Someone with a disability working? Yes. Yes. 
They can do so many things that you cannot imagine. Here is the brochure, Jama, Jama. Oh, I can offer the information, but I'm not in, ay, ay, pobrecito, no. Ah, no, it's a body language, the way that you present the information in a very positive way. I know it's hard and it's double hard, triple hard for our communities because we have the burden of the immigrants, not speak the language. And in plus of that, someone came to us and said, you have a son who will be is autistic. <sighs> oh, is born with Down syndrome. And the father say, and I'm not talking something that is not true. Ma, the best way, friend of Mar Margarita has a child with Down syndrome. And the father said, I cannot handle this. A year and a half ago. I'm not talking for years. And my daughter said, mommy. And I said, well, invite Melissa. We can have cafecito aquí en casa. And I said, Melissa. She's from El Salvador. You know very well that you have me, I have Margarita, to help you, to help to raise La Niña, which is, will be the most beautiful girl in the world. And El Pinche, say bye-bye to the Pinche, man. Ah! Adios. You know? Are you sure, Senora Fajardo? Yes, I am. You know me, you, this, since you were 10 years old, because it was the best friend of Margarita. And now Margarita has a niece who has Down syndrome, and I have a grand niece who is, you know, kind of someone very dear to my corazón. And, but the way that I presented to Melissa and the family from El Salvador, they trust me. And they said, oh, yes, it's possible. And so many parents in Northern Virginia and nationally, they have been telling, it's not the end of the war. It's how I present, how I to say to them about disability. It's something that is, it was for me. Not anymore. But I, I need to confess, it was for me. Oh, my God. I'm a lawyer. Go, go. And I, nowadays, I see Margarita. Driving, finally, I was able to see her driving. <laughs> she said, Mommy, I can't go to pick you from the airport. I said, Okay, oh, okay. And she said, Hola, Mommy, you don't trust me, isn't it? <laughs> I am. I said, Mommy, be honest. I said, No, I am. But you need to understand. <laughs> she's driving, you know, she's, she's driving. All oh, the possibilities. Here in the United States. So when you uphold a parent, the first thing they can say is like, I, I, I know it seems like it's the end of the world, but it's not. If child is born in the most wonderful country that they will protect, they will, I mean, help you kids to be, be able to be the best, the best person, the best child. But it has to be a lot changing your mindset. From you? Child, yes, from the parents. Compare what the child being born here and they have opportunity to write like uh, 
and I, is, is this a classical example of the Down syndrome yeah. child for my parents that I said, A, uh, uh, stream, mainstream family, gringa family who have a born with Down syndrome. And they said, what is available for, for him or, or her? The list of resources. What I need to go. What is the early childhood development office? La, 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 la. Us. <laughs> and I said, you're losing time. Losing time. Healing, grieving something that is not going to change. But you need to set in mind what is available for my son or my daughter. They will let him to be someone who bridges right because it's possible. You said in this country, in this beautiful country, they has the only one public law, special education law, educación especial. FAPE, all those, you know, acronyms, it's only in the United States. And I say that for sure. It's a, the most beautiful, and I say that as a lawyer, because I've been reading many times that piece of legislation that I translated when I was working with Judy at the Department of Education 20 years ago, that provides public education for those who have a disability. No one in any country has that piece. Has something here, they are, you know, accessibility, something here and there, but the piece of legislation as it is, receiving public funding from the approved by the Congress, is only United States. And I said, Mira, look, you are in the United States. Get the mind to have the, the children and for the, for the services providers too. You know, it's not there in the world. Learn about the system. I'm almost done. Conduct workshops and movements in Spanish, please. In Espanol. So many resources. Oh, and now a, a second generation of our kids who are attending college, who are getting a special education as a master's degree. I said, oh, it's que bueno. When someone called me and said, Ms. Fajardo, my daughter is uh, having a quick master degree in special education. Oh, que bueno. A lot of nurses and rehab, physical and occupational therapists. Our new generation of Latinos living in Northern Virginia, we have 56% who are born in here and attending college. And attending college. The rate of graduation in Latinos have been increasing immensely. Those new professionals can do that, can teach in Spanish. Especially, not that the parents need to learn English, yes, they do. But in this particular field, escuchar en español about my son, the strength, and what is available in español is a poquito mejor, a little better. <laughs> I'm almost done. Uh, connections. How teach the third language? I already talked about the third language in here. Thank you, thank you again, because we have not only we have to learn English, but we have also learned about a special education terminology, which is a little bit difficult. Culturally rele relevant translations connect with trust networks. This need to be reciprocal. <laughs> Pay for focus group. Yes, sometimes I get calls and say, oh, I need to have a focus group in Spanish. And I say, well, how much are you going to pay for, for the families to participate? Because it's always, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a nice to feel that, you know, that you are rewarded, that you count and as at the ministry, because the ministry community gets paid to participate in focus group. And I always advocating for that when I voluntarily do that. <laughs> I do voluntarily. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. I I have Isabella at the White House at the Eastern Road. 
And this is the mother of Isabella, who is a colleague of mine. She's a partner liaison in Pesos County. And I would say colleague, I was a community liaison many years ago in one school. And she said, Rosalia, I have a daughter who was born with Down syndrome. And she's from Peru. She said, I know in Peru is, it will be shame, and, but uh, I'm living in the United States. And she said, what are you going to do? I'm going to found the Latino Association de Padres con Niños con Down Syndrome. And I said, okay. And I so often do workshops. And one day she said, say, Rosalia, because you go to the White House so often, I want Isabella to be at the Easter Bowl. I said, well, I, uh, okay, let me see what I can do. And because the connections that we have, we were able to invite this administration at the Easter egg roll last April, did one Easter roll for children with disabilities, only for them. And uh, they sent the tickets for Independent Center and Isabella and friends of Isabella and all everybody else in Margarita leading the group went to the way house. Finally, they were waiting for that. They were dreaming for that. And Isabella was very, it was raining a little bit, but then it was clear and Isabella was well-dressed and everybody else was at the way house. Uh, it was because the connections that we go and we do internally and in our community. All done, almost done. I want you to show Davey. My famous is Davey, yes, that's me. With Davey, autistic, Bolivian. Maria said, aquí está Davey. And I said, he's 20. You, me saying he's 20, but anyway. You, he cannot talk with people, I said. Okay, he's a peer mentor. We have a program in Independence Center with peer mentors and, you know, interns. I said, okay. I said, okay, David. Uh, is a trusted disability champion, outreach partner, my outreach partner. And I said, David, I need to go to say hello to everybody. Were you able to be at the table and hand out the brochures? But you need to smile because you cannot be like, and see me, he said to me, I can do that. Okay, ciao. <laughs> and like, I was kind of looking. <laughs> it's like 20 minutes later, he was smiling to the people and handed out, handed out the brochure. I almost wasn't, I always, I'm so emotional. And I said, okay, David, you did it. Mommy came and I said, suéltalo. You know, he has to be by himself. He can do so many things. He has smiles, he can talk, and it's time for him to live by himself. Huh? Yeah, because he was literally with him. Ms. Fajardo, here is David. I said, hey, David's 20 years, <laughs> suéltalo. And here is David smiling with me. <laughs> Through the connections and Las Emprendedoras. It's a group of Latino mothers that NCMB in partnership with uh, El Poder de Ser Mujer. We are teaching how to do cooking and baking in Northern Virginia. Many of them have children with disabilities and we are providing skills for them to have their own business or be able to work. And that way they can provide better life for for the kids with disabilities and, you know, and also teach. I have one who is, has a lot of intellectual disabilities taking the class in a mainstream setting. And aquí están, the Latinas mothers training themselves to be part of the mainstream community because the Latinas in the United States are the most powerful force creating a small business. The small business is the force of the economy in this country, but in that category, Latinas are creating every day more and more small business and, and providing with NCMB the tools for them to teach the, the youth uh, more skills. In Haciendo Panes, Bakery or Bakery, you know, 
our traditional bakery. Uh, okay, okay, señor. Takeaways. We have been talking all. Our bags may look the same, but we are different. Consider ways to respect and embrace our differences. Go deeper to find out who you are serving and where they are coming. Build the trust. Begin with the school and the family liaisons from the Latino community. Many school systems today have the, that person who helps to connect the families with the school. Uh, consider the second generation of immigrants who are bilingual and who can be culturally trained in the disability world. Face I want to present in Spanish. I do for free. <laughs> and then gracias. And I don't know if they are going to send the presentation or my information and then CNB. Uh, hold on. Uh, about SMB Independent Center in Northern Virginia is the SEAL, what we call the Center for Independent Living. Uh, we do, uh, we are in Northern Virginia, serve Arlington, Fairfax County, Fall Church, um, Fall Church City. And I do presentations uh, through the state, especially for Latino parents, uh, no fee for free. Uh, just need to send me a limousine and I, I, I just listen. Uh, I've been everywhere in Virginia uh, presenting about uh, special education now and, and working in the independence field. I kind of grew up myself and I went to work with SEALs at Center for Independent Living and pushing, advocating so hard for the independence center to have programs that are appeal to our youth with disabilities and our parents who are, you know, with the, and the Latino parents who have youth with disabilities. And we, I'm, I'm building a kind of role for them to know that La Esperanza sigue. Yes, we have hopes. And yes, si se puede. And si se puede. Yes, yes, we can. Because we have everything in here. We just need to know how to find it, how to get the best of the system. Thank you so very much.